Hello again, and thanks for taking this course. Having sufficient financial resources are always beneficial to continue the operations of sustainable urban mobility projects. In this part of the course, I would like to share some instruments that are available for governments to obtain additional financial resources. Exploiting these resources can not only provide financial resources for sustaining a project, but also deter the use of personal automobiles. If we have not met earlier, my name is Sunny Kodukula and I work as a senior researcher at the Wuppertal Institute. I've been working in the area of sustainable urban mobility in emerging economies for the past 16 years. This video is going to be in three parts. So let's get into where those additional resources for our sustainable transport projects are. So as a recap, we have seen in our previous sections of this course that going in the current mobility paradigm will result in unfavorable consequences in the form of poor air quality, congestion, reduced road safety, etc. We have established that sustainable mobility is a viable alternative. It supports us in developing equitable, safe, environmentally friendly and affordable transport choices. Through proper planning practices, we can also create an integrated transport system. An important aspect to remember throughout is getting the priorities right in our planning and implementation. The picture of the reverse traffic pyramid nicely describes what the priorities ought to be in sustainable mobility. The active modes, that is walking and cycling, on, are on the highest level or have the highest priority followed by public transport modes, irrespective of whether the public transport mode is based on rail or on uh, or a bus-based system. Then the priority is given to private or personal motor vehicles, and then finally to flying. Though flying for urban travel is luckily not that common in many of our cities. Sustainable mobility is also spatially more efficient. The space occupied by personal cars and the number of people they move is clearly inefficient. Walking and cycling can move 10 times more people than personal cars. And public transport, depending on the kind of public transport, can clearly move up to 40 times more number of people. And this clearly shows where our priorities need to be when we start allocating the financial resources for transport. We might be under the impression that we pay for the total cost of our journey when we use our cars, motorcycles or the public transport system, yet we only pay a part of the cost, that is the direct cost. This is often in the form of the cost of the fuel, the time we spend for travel, and if we are a public transport user, the, the cost of the fare. And there are a lot of other costs that are imposed by motor vehicles and they are not paid by motorists. And these are the indirect costs. Indirect costs include the cost of the environment or cost to the environment uh, due to the combustion of uh, fossil fuel, the cost of uh, building roads and flyovers to ease motorized traffic and loss of urban space due to building more roads and ex expanding existing roads and providing parking facilities. Further, the cost of time lost due to congestion caused by motor vehicles is also a cost of a society. And then there are other uh, health related costs due to uh, worsening of air quality and due to road accidents. Who pays for these costs? The costs are often shared by people who do not use motor vehicles and the government to a great extent. And the taxes that are used for building the motor vehicle infrastructure also come from people who do not use or own any motor vehicles. And when there are so many costs being imposed on the governments, the governments are in a fix. Though they intend to develop better and new infrastructure for sustainable mobility, they do not immediately see the opportunities for additional revenue. 
majority of the funding may have been allocated for motorized modes because uh, there may be a perception that motorized uh, or motorization is a sign of economic development and investing in such infrastructure for motor vehicles leave the public coffers dry for any further investment in public transport or for promoting active modes of travel. And at a national level, countries also look for international sources of funding to support their shift to sustainable mobility. Presuming that without additional external resources, sustainable mobility cannot be implemented. These international resources, though very helpful, can only cover a small part of the project and they also seek a considerable contribution from the country. While the fact is sustainable mobility infrastructure is way cheaper to implement compared to infrastructure for personal motorized modes. There are various funding opportunities available at the local government level, at the subnational level. This could be either a state or a province, depending on where you come from, and national level, and of course, from the international level. But do keep in mind that our aim in this course is to, or in this video of the course, is to find resources that will enable the implementation of sustainable mobility, that is, prioritize active modes and public transport. This also means reflecting the true cost of travel for the motorists. And the options that I mentioned here in this video uh, is just a small selection. If financing sustainable transport is of your interest, do feel free to read the additional resources mentioned under the reading lists. And let's discuss the options at the local level in the next video. And thanks for joining.